Okay, so good afternoon. Welcome to the uh, Activity Safer Mass and uh, IFC Mass the uh, Colloquial Series. So we're having a problem in particle physics uh, throughout this uh, month. And uh, uh, we've had many visitors uh, uh, here that, uh, that uh, are giving talks and colloquia. And today we're very pleased to have uh, Germano Nardini, um, uh, who is also teaching us for this program. And uh, so Germano was uh, a, a PhD student of a well-known physicist in the audience. Famous, yeah. Famous, famous physicist in the audience, uh, Mariano. And then uh, he had several uh, postdocs around the world. And he's an expert in gravitational waves, and he's now at the University of Stavanger in uh, Norway. Norway. And he's going to talk about uh, news from the East. Hi. Yeah, thanks. Thanks for the introduction, and thanks for the invitation, of course. And thanks to everybody for coming here. That today is holiday for you, right? So. <laughs> Okay, uh, fine. Um, good. So, what, what, what? Yes. No, no, otherwise, uh, I, I shout. Um, so, uh, the talk uh, is about uh, Lisa. And uh, when I prepared the talk, I realized that there were some similarities from, between the message that I want to convey by means of this uh, talk and uh, something about the history of Brazil, and uh, Columbus, and uh, Amerigo Vespucci. The lesson from uh, the history of Brazil, Columbus, and Amerigo Vespucci is the following. That it's true that it's very important to take data, Columbus, but it's also important to interpret properly them, Vespucci. And this is the equivalent of the experimentalist, maybe, and the theorist. No, it was Cabral, but he's probably busy. Okay, <laughs> okay, fine, fine. <laughs> By accident, they say. <laughs> okay, fine. So, um, yes, I think that this is strictly related also to, to Lisa, to any experiment, but in particular to Lisa. So, to put Lisa in context, uh, of course, what we what to li would like to say is, okay, it's the wonderful age for gravitational waves uh, and physics related to that. And uh, there was a paper long ago that can summarize the situation. Even though the paper was uh, 50 years ago. So the windows of obs observational astronomy have become broader. With gravitational wave astronomy, we are on the threshold, or just beyond the threshold, of adding another window. And there is the possibility that gravitational wave astronomy will reveal entirely new phenomena. And the future of gravitational wave astronomy looks bright. So, <laughs> exactly. So, my contribution is, okay, uh, 50 years later, is the following. First, I think that it's the presence of gravitational wave astronomy that looks bright and not the, the future. And the second is that it's not only astronomy, it's physics. And uh, I hope that by means of the, this talk, I can convince you about uh, the fact that it's uh, the presence of gravitational wave physics that looks bright. So it looks uh, an age ago that uh, there was uh, the first announcement of the gravitational wave detection. And by it was four years ago. And uh, of course, this detection, you know, had a, a huge impact on, uh, gravita on, uh, on the community. On the, on the press and uh, on the population. And uh, this, uh, but this was, it is fair to, to clarify that this was not the discovery of gravitational wave. It was a direct detection of gravitational wave. And the reason is that many years before, there was somebody else, other people, that discovered gravitational waves. But, this discovery was by means and by, by, by performing indirect detection. So, what was uh, this indirect detection about? Well, uh, the main point was that uh, gravitation, uh, general relativity predicts that uh, um, two very massive bodies, when they are moving, uh, they produce uh, space-time perturbation, and this uh, perturbation space-time uh, depart from the source and uh, they propagate. And these gravitational waves carry energy. This means that by conservation of energy, if uh, you have uh, 
the system has to conserve energy. And this implies that if you have gravitational waves that are carrying energy, the source is losing energy. And this was observed in the Taylor binary system that uh, by Taylor and the person, um, Taylor and the uh, Hulse, I don't know, the, yeah. And uh, this was uh, the, the observation. They were, what they were measuring is, by means of some observable, the energy loss of this uh, binary system where one of the two bodies is, uh, is a pulsar. So by means of observing the pulses of, of the, the pulsar, they were, able, they were able to monitor the, the energy of the system. And here you can see what you expect if the system is not emitting gravitational waves. So the total energy of the system is conserved. And this, the solid line, is the prediction of general relativity, in which case you have that the, the system emits gravitational waves and these gravitational waves carry energy. So, and these bullet points are the measurements. So you can see that they match with uh, the fact that gravitational waves exist and they are produced by this system was uh, wonderful. And this is why these guys uh, won the Nobel Prize. But this was the indirect measurement and uh, most of the time, well, we prefer direct measurements, right? And uh, so the, the, this is one of the points for which uh, we can consider the detection by LIGO was really important. But there are also some aspects that uh, are, uh, are important. And one of these aspects is that the measurement with LIGO not only measure gravitational waves, but measure with a very high accuracy. And this accuracy allowed us to detail the, the, the characteristics of the sources with high precision. The detection of the first measure of the first uh, black hole binary uh, allowed to us to understand that the event was uh, for uh, around 400 uh, megaparsec away from us. And the two black holes before merging, they had a mass of 36 plus five minus four solar masses and 29 plus four minus, I don't remember the number is, uh, I can tell you. Okay, minus four, yes, so solar masses. And these two initial black holes formed a black hole that had uh, 62 plus minus four uh, solar masses. So important observation here, you are able to measure the distance of the event with quite a high accuracy, and uh, you are able also to reconstruct the mass of the black holes with high accuracy. And curiosity, you, you take this number, you sum, it to the, you sum this number to this number, and you can notice that you, you have around three solar masses that are not present in the final black hole, but are three solar masses of, that were emitted, the energy of the equivalent of three solar masses that were emitted and produced uh, in, in the form of gravitational waves. So, in order to have uh, an accurate detection, what you need is uh, an excellent detector and uh, also a good uh, template of what you want to measure. And uh, you can see in this case, this was uh, theoretical predictions. The theoretical prediction is also the, this red line here. And you can see that the residual between the measurement, the data, and uh, the theoretical prediction is the residual and the residuals are very small. So, in order to be sure that you, are, you, you, you detected a black, hole, a black hole binary, yes, you need a, a good detector, but also a good theoretic understanding. Well, but uh, this is uh, LIGO, and the talk uh, is uh, LISA, right? So, why I'm personally interested in LISA, and I think that LISA is interesting? Because currently, you have two kinds of experiments that can measure gravitational waves. The first kind of measure of the experiment is LIGO-like, you know, a kind of interferometer where you have uh, two mirrors and you do interferometry with uh, these two mirrors at a distance of four kilometers. Or you can use uh, uh, pulsar time arrays that are sensitive to the nano-earth, gravitational waves of frequency of nano-earth. And in this system, you're more or less using 
the same idea of, of, uh, of LIGO, but with the distance difference, difference that now you're not emitting light and uh, observing the light that the mirrors reflect. But what you use is the fact that you have precise mirrors that emit light, and by checking the, the, the time delay between what you receive from one pulsar and from you receive from the other pulsar, the two mirrors, and you do, you do an average over the many pulsars you have, you can observe and uh, put constraints if uh, in the, on uh, the gravitational waves that are coming. Because if I have a, a lighthouse there emitting light every peep, 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 and there I have a lighthouse, lighthouse emitting the light, like peep, peep, peep. And this is very peep, 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 with high accuracy peep, peep. And there is high accuracy peep, 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 right? And suddenly we have peep, 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 right? And this, you compare with this, that instead of doing peep, 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 okay, something is going on there. So of course, very slow explanation, but I guess that you, <laughs> yeah? So a physicist is doing peep, 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 you know. <laughs> okay, so, um, well, right, nice, but I wanted to say also something else. And the main point is that here, LIGO-like experiments are sensitive to uh, gravitational waves between one Earth and uh, 1,000 Earth, and uh, pulsar time arrays are sensitive to gravitational waves in the frequency of the nano Earth. And here in the middle, well, and this is why we want LISA. Here in the middle, we expected many astrophysical objects. These astrophysical objects consist, for instance, of black holes that are uh, in at the center of galaxies. And this, you have these two galactic galaxies that merge. And this is equivalent of the kind of LIGO black hole binary, but scale up to masses of 10 to the 8, 10 to the 4 solar masses. You can have uh, uh, compact binary systems in, uh, in um, which, for instance, is two white dwarfs. The emission of gravitational waves is not very powerful in this case, but these sources can be very close to us in such a way you can detect them. And uh, moreover, a third combination where you have uh, a binary system where, um, where the, the mass of the two black holes is, not, uh, is hierarchical. One, for instance, one of black hole, one, the mass of the one black hole is 10 to the 4 times the mass of the other black hole. And I will show a video to, and the behavior of this kind of system where there is the, this hierarchy in masses is uh, peculiar and interesting. Mm. And uh, these sources are there, we expect them. And moreover, we expect them also in large number, which means that we'll be able to measure those kind of objects many times with high, with high statistics. And by means of high statistics, we expect to know many issues about uh, their, their evolution and formation. So I would say that there are good reasons to, to build a detector here in the Middle Earth region. And this detector is, is LISA. What is the, the in short, the, the, all the evolution of, uh, of LISA? Well, of course, you don't require me to show you that here. What? OK, there is a wonderful button here that kills everything. Yeah, that's our again, blah, 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 present for the uh, 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 uh. So you have many, many, you expect not to have only a few these objects, but you expect to have many of them, so high, high statistics. So good reason to have an experiment, Lisa. And, and, um, the, the idea of building an experiment that is sensitive to gravitational waves in that frequency is quite old, because the first idea I'm aware of uh, came from uh, 1918, and this was an experiment called the Lagos. 
the idea was that in order to be sensitive to gravitational waves in the milliards, what you have is a kind of LIGO, but instead of having arms of four kilometers, you, have, you need arms of the order of gigameters. And this is why you need to go to space. Moreover, in order to be uh, LIGO, one limitation of LIGO is the seismic noise. And of course, if you go to space, you, are, you don't suffer from uh, seismic noise. So this is the reason why LISA must be an experiment in space. It's, uh, of course, you, you start with uh, some, uh, some ideas and then they evolve. And at some point, if any of you applied for uh, some grants, uh, at the beginning of the grants, uh, typically they ask you for a crony of your, uh, your fellowship. And this guy probably thought, uh, fine, Lagos didn't work. LISA didn't work. Let's go for space board astronomical gravitational wave interferometry to test aspect, which is Sagittarius. But yeah, you know, you want to have a, a nice acronym, but then you are in trouble. Um, this, there is a time delay here. Yes. And well, the idea as I said, uh, told you before, is to have a kind of LIGO in space with arms of, uh, of length of gigameters. And uh, moreover, instead, the mirrors that uh, you have in LIGO have to be uh, replaced by m mirrors in free fall, so uh, free fall masses, because as in LIGO, what you want to do is to find the relative displacement of the mirrors and uh, in order to do that, in LIGO, what you want to do is to isolate the mirrors from all the noise that you have around, uh, seismic noise, for instance, so vibra vibrations so of the, so the, the plane that is landing. Here, it's something similar, but in order to, because you want to know that, that, that the mirror in space is not perturbed by, for instance, uh, microliths that are hitting the, the body or, uh, or similar, or solar wind, so what you need to do is to be sure that your test masses there are in free fall with very high accuracy. And once you are sure that these masses are in free fall and with very high accuracy, you can do interferometry and uh, test that, uh, okay, and do perform measurements that are, and if you find displacements, fine. They are probably related to gravitational waves. Of course, in order to accept uh, this kind of experiment, uh, you need to be sure that you are able to, to put these masses in free fall with uh, such accuracy. And this was uh, the, the goal of the, of the LISA Pathfinder. LISA Pathfinder was a NISA mission, and uh, basically it's a kind of uh, arm of LISA squeezed in uh, less than one meter. And uh, and there, what you are measuring is uh, that you are able to put a mass in free fall with the accuracy you need. This, this uh, the LISA Pathfinder was launched in uh, 2015 and uh, took data for uh, till uh, mid 2017. And the results are the following. This was uh, the requirements that was put by, by the space agency in order to say, fine, if you are able to put a free fall mass, a mass in free fall with its accuracy, uh, this is successful. And uh, we believe that you will be able to, to, to build LISA. And the results are the following, as you can see, this line, right? So you are by far below the, the requirement. And Actually, you are even below the requirement that you expect for a future uh, mission like LISA. To give you an idea about the, the, here, what you are plotting, what you are plotting is, uh, let's say, the residual relative acceleration of the test masses. So a mass that is perfectly in a free fall, uh, would, would have this number 10 to the minus infinity. And uh, here you can see the, the measurement in the, as a function of the frequency. 
and uh, you are sensitive to effects that are, at least to me, incredible. You are sensitive to the Brownian noise of the residual gas you have uh, in the cage housing the, the free fall mass, the mass. You are sensitive to the fact that your, uh, your, uh, your system is uh, rotating, which means that you have a residual centrifugal force. And uh, you're also sensitive to all the, in order to know the position of the, of the mass, you need uh, some lasers. And, uh, but the lasers have a short noise. And you're sensitive also to the short noise of the, of the laser, laser hitting the, the, the test masses. So the result was uh, super excellent, and uh, this was considered uh, well, the proof that we did, that it was possible to launch LISA. In addition, in 2016, there was the announcement that, uh, of LIGO, and uh, there was also a lot of activity um, proving that uh, the science return of LISA is uh, very important. I will mention briefly later. And uh, at that point also NASA and other countries, they said, they said that they, they were interested in the experiment, they wanted to contribute. And uh, ESA put uh, the call for the, the space mission. And uh, after the proposal, the mission was uh, accepted and adopted for the L3 launch. L3, launch. L3 is the most expensive mission you have in every period of uh, LISA European Space Agency missions. And the launch will be uh, in 2030, more or less. So just to give you an extra picture, you have LISA is this kind of LIGO in space, but it's not only one LIGO because you have uh, three mirrors. So in this case, you can build uh, two LIGO, actually three LIGOs, but one of, the, one of these LIGO is uh, a, a linear dependence of the other two, so you have two independent LIGO. And uh, something that I already said, and something that I didn't say is instead that what you want to do is to have this mission taking data for at least four years, but you put consumable for 10 years because the expectation is that despite the fact that you build an experiment and you put there all the engineering requirements to have the mission um, taking data for four years, in fact, you put some margins and these margins typically allow you to have a mission that uh, stays there for more time. But in order to have some, uh, to take measurement, Lisa, you have also to, to move, to drift the spacecraft once in a while, and for that you need the uh, fuel. So this is why you, you put fuel for 10 years. So if everything goes uh, well, what you expect is that you are going to take data for 10 years. Then, in short, this is what happened uh, recently, from 2013 to, to today. And uh, you can see that here we had the LISA Pathfinder, and uh, here there are the so-called uh, where the time when uh, the, the work packages and the goals of the mission were written. In a, they will be rewritten, but this is the time when, and I, I'm going to discuss them in a couple of slides. Because I want also to, to show you the timeline in the long future from now to launch. You can see that the, the launch will be before 2034. So mission requirements. Well, when you build a mission, you cannot say to the engineers, uh, I want to detect uh, two black holes with uh, these solar masses. What you have to do is uh, to provide some bounds in order that he builds the experiment and the experiment has the capability to do the measurement that you want to do. This measure here, you see this is the sensitivity curve of the experiment we want, LISA. But of course, when the engineers are building the experiment, uh, for them, is it important if for some reason they get this, the sensitivity curve here or here instead of ex exactly here? 
And this, the goal of the emission requirement is actually to, to put some bounds on the sensitivity curve you need based on the science that you want to achieve. For instance, if you want to detect galactic binary with some accuracy, and which correspond to physics that you correspond to uh, gravitational waves in this frequency region, you want that this is the, 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 the engineer will know that in order to do that, the sensitivity curve has to be below a given value. So, but for us, maybe it's better to put, uh, to put explicitly what this mission requirement means. Um, one mission requirement was about the galactic binaries. Galactic binaries, we expect, in the case of LISA, we expect them to, have, to measure many galactic binaries. Galactic binaries are, uh, um, are binaries that typically, for instance, work by doors, and, but they're very close to us. So even if the signal at the source is not very powerful, since they're very close to us, the signal, when, once it reaches us, is enough powerful to be detected. And uh, as often happens when uh, you have many sources, you have some sources that will be, some events that will be able to, to detect individually. So you have the beep, and you said that the beep comes from there. But many sources, many events will be weak. So I like beep, 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 beep. I like beep, beep, you know? And uh, if you have many PPP that are not loud enough, you will not be able to resolve individually. And what the final result is, and okay? So for galactic binaries, you have many. Some of them you can resolve individually, so you can do physics related to these galactic binaries. But a fraction of them, a large fraction of them, will provide the sources that cannot be resolved individually. So a background or foreground depends on. And by doing this kind of physics, you can determine the formation evolution of the galactic binaries. Moreover, you have also uh, massive black holes uh, binaries. And uh, you expect, as you can see here, you, you expect many of them also at higher shift. And uh, by, by measuring these, uh, glad, uh, these uh, black holes binaries, higher shift means that you are going to, to the very past of this object. And this is why you expect to be able to determine the evolution and uh, well, the evolution information of these objects. You need to, do, to perform the measure with some uh, features, but the answers that you would like to address in the end are like, uh, do intermediate black holes exist? You know, black holes for the formation, you have the two ranges, uh, solar massive black holes like uh, those of LIGO, and black holes that are large, heavier than uh, 10 uh, solar masses. In the middle, you don't have the formation channels that provide that, that uh, kind of uh, black holes. So in principle, you don't, you don't expect to have, uh, in the standard uh, astronomy, you don't expect to have black holes of 100 solar masses. Mm, moreover, uh, you can also do uh, with these black holes, if there is an environment or uh, well, they are in the environment because they have black holes that are the black holes in the middle of the galaxy. By when they typically for uh, black holes that have solar masses, these black holes are possibly isolated. So when two black holes collide, they don't, since there is the event horizon, that you don't expect to, to have an electromagnetic signal. But in this case, since the two block black holes are merging, but when they merge, they carry with them all the, the mass and the stuff of the galaxy. You expect there to have energetic uh, events. So in this case, you expect to have, to have an electromagnetic counterpart. And if you have an electromagnetic counterpart, you can do like LIGO uh, with, the, the, with the neutral star events. You can study the, the, the Hubble law by, by matching the redshift of the event and the distance. I will come back later to that, maybe. You can also uh, do physics related to extreme asteroid spirals. And uh, these objects are extremely relativistic. I first show you a video about uh, a simulation of them. Oh. 
Okay, this video is uh, this video, the video that I will show you, is a video where you have uh, Okay, you have uh, the, the system that I was mentioning at the beginning, where you have a black hole that is very massive, a second black hole that has mass that is much smaller than the other one. In this case, you can see here that this is three million solar masses, this one, and the other one is uh, uh, 200 solar masses. Hmm. Yeah, 270. And uh, the peculiarity, what matters here is that, might be I'm very naive, but the first time before we stay in the video, I was using to the solar system, right? So you have the system, the, the sun, and the planet, you expect something like that. But these objects are very not relativi very relativistic, and moreover, these objects have high spin. So the total angular momentum is conserved, but not the, the, the angular momentum of the single object. And this is what uh, you, so naively, I was expecting like a kind of solar system. I'm very naive, of course, and I'm sure that you expect something like that. Okay, that is the orbit. It's so fast that it's a continuous line. But you can see, of course, it's not a planar motion. And here in the corner, you can see the velocity of the... <laughs> and this is the waveform. What? Okay, this is the usual beep. So from the numbers you, you saw, you see that these objects are very relativistic and uh, they're super massive. So we are speaking about hundreds of solar masses, hundred, an object of uh, having a mass of hundreds of solar masses moving almost at the speed of light. And uh, well, it's, uh, it's very hard. And remember, as I told you at the beginning, it's important to have uh, templates of the waveform in order to perform detections. Or at least uh, to have a good parameter estimate, to do a, a, a good parameter estimation of the sources. Okay, for some reason I don't know how to. Okay. Uh, Okay, yeah, we are, we are here. Well, since uh, these objects are relativistic and very massive, you can imagine that, uh, of course, you are at the regime where uh, you are at the limit of uh, numeric general relativity. And uh, these objects are very challenging, but they carry, if we are able to interpret them properly, they carry a lot of information about the GR, possible deviation of GR, and uh, also formation of, uh, okay, the evolution of objects in extreme conditions, right, this one. Then, uh, these are sources that are, um, what? Transient sources, right? In the sense that, these sources appear, evolve, and disappear. But there are other sources, like the galactic binary was mentioned before, those that you can resolve, that are there forever. In the sense that you don't have a signal that appears and disappears. They're there all the time. 
And these are the foregrounds. And for personal reason, I'm particularly interested in these foregrounds. And these foregrounds, in general, as mentioned for the Galactic binaries, are, are uh, sources that are too weak or too frequent or too close one each other to be uh, resolved individually. So when you are not able to resolve individually, and you have many, this will uh, provide a kind of background of the signal. Mm. In order to, and there are many sources that provide a stochastic uh, uh, foreground uh, or this kind of signal. And uh, this means that if you have astrophysical sources that provide a strong, uh, huge uh, foreground, this foreground can cover the signal that you would like to, to discover. And for this reason, it's also important to have a good uh, uh, template of, of these signals. Because if you have a good template, you're able to, to measure them and subtract and to, do, to explore the physics that was covered by, by these foregrounds. In the case of the galactic binaries, there is a trick. And the point is that uh, Lisa is moving around, is moving the Lagrangian point uh, L1, as Mariano knows. And uh, this means that uh, the angle between Lisa and the galactic disk is not constant, it's changing. By changing, uh, this means that uh, uh, you, the signal coming from the galactic disk is not constant all the time, it's modulated. Because you are more sensitive to the, to the signal when Lisa is facing the galactic disk and you're less sensitive to the, to the signal when Lisa is uh, orthogonal to that, to that direction. And this is the modulation, the early modulation you have uh, for uh, LISA that is orbiting with uh, between Sun and Earth and, uh, and the, galactic, uh, the, the, the galactic binaries in the galactic disk. Then you have other sources of foregrounds, and these are the, uh, the black hole binaries of a mass of one tensile masses, like the masses of uh, discovered by, uh, detected by, by, by LIGO. And uh, also in this case, you expect them to be so frequent that for them, some of them, you will be not able to resolve them individually. And uh, these sources are interesting because they evolve. They will stay in the LISA band for uh, hours or years, and then they will evolve. Because by evolving, you remember, in the merging, what you do is to increase the frequency when in this parallel phase. So here, what you expect for this object is that you detect in LISA, and then after some years, or uh, years, typically, you, you have the signal that goes from LISA to the LIGO band. And this is important because this means that you can predict to say to, to speak to your friends of LIGO, and tell them, see that at this date, you will have this, black, this binary black holes that enter in there, your, your band. So be prepared. And uh, this is also useful because uh, this object, when enter the, the band, will maybe, the LIGO band, maybe will not stay longer. And if you want to detect the electromagnetic counterpart, this means that also you have to alert the electromagnetic telescope to be there. And this means that by doing this physic of LISA, you will be able to predict and to alert the electromagnetic telescope and LIGO that in that date, you will have that event in this, that sky path. So uh, in this case, sky path. So point your electromagnetic telescope to in that direction. And moreover, there is uh, also the early universe. Some, and now we, we leave astrophysics and we go into cosmology. Uh, some sources, well, there are many sources. The, the classic ones are uh, the cosmic strings. These are objects that are produced in a phase transition that uh, leads to cosmic defects. In particular, in the case of strings, uh, this, this object will stay there for, for a long time, but and, uh, in a given ta lapse of time, they will emit gravitational wave, or they will intersect and collide, or they can emit burst, gravitational burst. So in this case, you expect this kind of, uh, of signal right? that can cross LISA, LISA band, 
but can also cross the, the booster time arrays experiment. But depending on a parameter of, of this object, the tension of the, the, the string, you see that depending on this parameter, you have that the, the, the background produced by this uh, object will be only exactly a LISA and not in uh, pulsar time like uh, experiment, or at some point it will be not detected by LISA. Moreover, this kind of signal is also sensitive to the degrees of freedom that are uh, there in, uh, in the plasma. And if you're able to detect this signal and you are able to reconstruct this line with high accuracy, well, this means that maybe you are able to, to measure the parts of from, uh, from uh, the, the standard line. Moreover, here what you're doing in order to predict this uh, shape is to assume the standard lambda CDM model. But besides all the issue about lambda CDM models in late, late time, early stuff, uh, in any case, you, we don't know much about lambda CDM or the, the, the model of, the, of, of the universe much before BB, BBN. So it's an extrapolation assumption that we have the standard lambda CDM before BBN, but it's an assumption. And here you can see that if there is a departure for lambda CDM in the early universe, well, in, the, in this case, you expect to have departures on the signal that you expect. Also for inflation, the vanilla inflation produces a background that is flat in this area, is around 10 to the minus 15, 10 to the minus 17, too low to measure by LISA, but uh, model builders can convince you that they have a model where the vanilla slow roll inflation with a single field roll slow roll is not uh, the only case, and you have other possibility. And for the other possibilities, you have a signal, a stochastic gravitational background, <coughs> that can be detected by LISA. And then you have the cosmological first of the phase transition that I will speak maybe never during the, the case. And uh, so to summarize this part, I, I would like to, to stress the following. First of all, well, we, by means of LISA, we, we expect to measure galaxy binaries, extreme mass searching spirals, uh, super uh, massive black holes uh, binaries and early universe sources. So a lot of stuff can be done, and in principle we can have uh, surprises because when I, this LISA will measure this that frequency band for the first time, and in particular not only that frequency band but also this object, the gravitational waves produced by this object for the first time, and of course our experience with the standard model of particle physics that at some point your expectations are fulfilled and, uh, and luckily the detectors are exactly measuring what you expect. But for this kind of physics that is completely new, maybe the measuring will, be not, will not match exactly your expectations. So maybe surprises, interesting stuff. So let me stress, uh, go through briefly the, um, the, um, the early universe sources. Why are they important? Well, uh, astrophysical sources, of course, are important for many reasons. But in principle, you are able to detect these, uh, these, those sources in other, in other ways. But for the early universe sources, well, these gravitational waves are really a new window and a unique window. The reason is that in the early universe, when uh, you have the CMB time and uh, all photons that were produced before the CMB have, uh, um, okay, interact too often with the plasma of the universe. And this means that if you have a source producing photons here, the photons will reach us after colliding many times. Photons produced here instead will reach us without colliding many times. But the fact that they collide many times means that they lose part of the information that about the source. Instead, gravitational waves propagate, and their interaction is suppressed by the Planck mass. This means that what you expect is that a gravitational wave emitted in the early universe will be produced here, early universe, will propagate, and with 
we statistically the gravitational wave the gravitational wave wave will not interact with other stuff before the ECU. And this means that by detecting gravitational waves from the UJV universe, you will have uh, param information of paramount importance of the events, and these events can be measured only by doing this kind of physics. So, whatever I, th I, I show you seems uh, nice, but there is one, there are some subtleties that I would like to, to mention. And, uh, and these subtleties are peculiar of, of, to, to LISA. The first one is that LISA, as I told you, is sensitive to many, many sources. And for these sources, you expect to have many events. This means that what you expect is to have many sources at the same time. And uh, if you have many sources at the same time, it means that the overlap between the, the waveforms will be huge. And not only, if you have a stochastic background, you have that also the overlap between the, these, the waveforms of these events, these sources, and the cosmological sources will overlap. So it's not like uh, in, in the measurement maybe you're familiar to, typically where you have nothing and you have just an event that is connected to what you, what you would like to study and then nothing again. So you have a lapse of time where you have just the physics related to the particular source you want to study. Here you have all the time, everything together. And this is a mess, right? Because uh, this means that one, one point, you would like, in order to have a parameter estimation of your sources, you need to fit the, the template that you have with the data. And now what you have to do is to, to, to do a multi-fit of many sources at the same time. If you mistake well, the, the fit of one source, well, you pollute also the, the measurements of, uh, that you, you want to do for the other sources. And this is why this is a really tricky and unique to, to visa. <laughs> Second point is that uh, LISA uh, will fly and uh, you will switch on LISA, really switch on, only in space. So in order to know the, the noise of the instrument, it's not so obvious if there is a stochastic background because the noise of LISA is mostly expected to be a Gaussian noise. The stochastic background is an out, a, a Gaussian signal. So Concerning the, the waveforms of these uh, two um, contributions, they look the same. So in order to, to, be, to disentangle the, the noise, the disentangle the, the stochastic gravitation of a background from the noise, what you need is a good model of the noise. And this is not so trivial for something that goes to space and, uh, and so, but if you have a, a good uh, uh, model of the noise, you will be able to, to measure, for instance, a power law signal, like this one, with uh, high accuracy, even when the, the, the signal is below the instrument, the, the sensitivity curve of the instrument. And this is why. Well, because typically, in order to say, ah, oh, I'm sensitive to an event or not, what you do for the transient sources is to check if your signal is above the sensitivity of your, uh, your instrument. But here, in the case of the stochastic background, you have signals and many frequencies. So you can correlate the fact that you have a signal, that frequency, a frequency at that frequency, and if you use this correlation, you are sensitive to something below what you usually uh, are sensitive to. And uh, for instance, this is a, uh, an illustrative case. If you have a stochastic background that is this power law, these are what you the, the precision you expect to reach for uh, the, the reconstruction of the, uh, of the uh, petrol tilt and the amplitude of the, of the signal in log scale. And here, the dashed uh, dot uh, blue uh, dot uh, dash dot dot dash the blue line is the, the input signal and this gray band is the signal the reconstructed signal with the error bars so you can see that the error bars 
of the reconstruction is very small. So, um, last slide, next to last slide. Um, these are uh, the activity, well, I, the science, in order to carry this science, uh, you know, it's difficult to carry this science uh, alone. You need that kind of big collaboration. And uh, the collaboration is big. These are the working groups that uh, exist in the LISA consortium, which is the LISA collaboration. And these are the numbers of people involved in each uh, working group. For instance, the cosmology working group has 274 people some months ago. But nevertheless, as you can see, I, I, I hope to convince you that there is a lot to do. So if you are interested, uh, we can speak later, but there are different levels of commitment and, uh, and there is still a lot of room to, to participate and contribute. So maybe time to, con to conclude. And the conclusion is, uh, well, maybe I hope that the conclusion is uh, clear. Um, gravitational waves are connected to a lot of physics, not only to astronomy. And uh, LISA is sensitive to many phenomena related to this physics. And, um, and also LISA, as I told you, er, er, in order to, to reach a good uh, reconstruction of the sources and uh, to, to allow LISA to perform as the best way as possible, um, it's important that there are no unexpected sources. If there are unexpected sources, uh, as for sure we will have, you need to have pipelines that are suitable for unexpected sources. But nevertheless, theorists can reduce the unexpected. So, and this is why the theory community, I think, is very welcome to contribute to possible signals in order that when you do it, we do the, param the, the, we build the pipeline of LISA, we are already doing that now, we can consider all possible of reasonable sources and signals. And in such a way, if you have the template, well, easy will be easier. Life will be easier. And uh, with that, I conclude. Thank you very much. Thank you, Germano. So I, I just want to say that Germano is giving a more technical talk uh, next week, I think. Yeah. So probably some of the details that uh, he glossed over uh, because of lack of time, he'll probably yeah. talk about uh, next yeah, week. Yeah. So uh, questions for Okay, so you mentioned the noise uh, in Lisa, no? Yeah. So where is the noise coming from mainly in this? Uh... What well, noise here is, okay, in first place, first level of answer is that the noise, any motion of the test masses that is not exactly the one corresponding to free fall. This is noise. What is noise, main source of noise, eh? Uh, what is noise can be, uh, what, what, what are the sources of this noise? This noise, for instance, the, the lasers are powerful because you need lasers of to covering a distance of gigameters. And uh, when they hit the, the, the test mass and they come back, they move the test mass, for instance. Then you have brilliant noise. Then you have other stuff that is every probably 12, 12 days, uh, you have to transfer data to Earth. And this means that you have to move the antenna. And this, okay, you're moving the system. And uh, you're not taking data when the antenna is moving because it's a disaster. But nevertheless, the time after the motion of the antenna is uh, critical. And uh, what well, you have the micro lights hitting the, the system and what? Well, so do people think that they can control the noise at that moment? Because it seems complicated, no? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes. Yes. Within uh, some margins. But luckily, it's not me doing it. <laughs> uh, thank you for the talk. Uh, do you expect to detect objects like cosmic strings from the experiments? Um, 
I can answer it in a different way. I mean, when I did my PCD, they convinced me that supersymmetry existed. Okay? And now, well, I'm at least doubting. So, I guess that in this case, I'm not, I have no measurement the parameter space of the possibility if some of these sources are <coughs> probable or not. And this, for instance, cosmic strings are one, one of these sources. I don't know. I'm, but I think that there is the chance, there is some possibility, and they, we are not building the instrument only for that. Because if you do an experiment only for something, well, you want to, and you spend a lot of money, you want to be, you must be convinced that there is that something. In the case of, in this case, Lisa is built for many reasons that are guaranteed. And so you want to be prepared also for other possible sources. So I don't know. Uh. Are there already models on the sort of signal you would expect from before the cosmic microwave background? Yes. For instance, uh, the cosmic strings would be uh, sources occurring before the, CM the CMB. Um, inflation, I was speaking about inflation, is also something that comes, happens before the CMB. The um, cosmological first order phase transition that I skipped are related to physics of at least 100 GV, and this is before CMB, and... Uh, but what I mean is, do you already have an expectation of the form of the signal, for example? For Either these sources? Yes, yeah. with some margins and errors. Huh? Thank you. More questions for Germano? So I have a question. What is the um, accuracy in, on the position of objects yeah. from Lisa? Because uh, you don't have, we only have these two arms, right? Yes. Uh, three arms. Three arms. But nevertheless, yes. Uh, uh, they are fine. I can show you that it was one square degrees for some sources. One square degree. Degree, but it depends on, on the signal to ratio of the signal, because the longer the signal is in your uh, in the detector, more, more data you have, more uh, accuracy. Yeah. Okay. That's, that's pretty good. Yeah. But this is the number that I copied, eh? So maybe, but the order of magnitude. And now there are studies in order to, yeah. Yes. This is very naive because I don't, I don't recall the, the pressure in the system. But would you expect some dust, some stuff in the in the in on the in the laser to change the maybe the optical path and to be an effect of, of noise, maybe Two, maybe dust or something in the solar system to maybe change the optical path to the of the lasers and be a source of noise or uh, any. Well, yeah, y y yes. I mean, the dust, just the mic. Okay, yeah, it hit in the the cages of the of the uh, that house the the, uh, the the test masses yeah in this case they are producing noise and uh, what well, yes may, because here right i was speaking mostly about the gaussian noise that is but we expect also to have glitches or we are stuff happening that can be related to what you're saying okay and yeah. you also have to model that yeah but yeah but I'm, for the stochastic background, I'm more scared about this, the, the, the noise that is all the time there, more than the transient. Uh -huh. For people looking for bus and transient, well, it's the other way around. There. Yeah, maybe there is a cloud of dust that's passing. I don't know. I don't know what yeah, okay. could happen in the. Yeah, but the fact is very minor, eh? I mean, it's not. But nevertheless, the accuracy you need is. Okay. Um, so just to remind you that uh, there is some refreshments upstairs for you guys that came in the holiday. So let's thank Germano again for this very nice talk. Uh, thanks to you.